What's going on guys, it's Jack Gales1875 here and today I thought I'd do something a bit different and finally do some Hibs content. So today's video is going to be about the story of how Hibs were founded. You guys enjoyed my football history videos like the one about Stalies and Hüttenstadt. So I thought, why not do it for Hibs? I've got a lot of German and English subscribers who might not know how Hibs were founded. Plus there's you fellow Hibies that might not know completely about our history. So I thought it'd be something interesting to do. And it is a really interesting story that goes back to the relevant issues at the time. And it's great just to know the history of such a great football club. So really looking forward to doing this one. Um, I've enjoyed making it. I hope you guys enjoy watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. So let's jump right into this. Before we talk about how Hibs are founded, there's some re very relevant history and backstory to the story of Hibs, and that is, of course, the Irish potato famine. So Hibs were founded in 1875, and in the 1870s, the situation in Ireland was pretty bad. A lot of people were being forced out of their homes because they couldn't pay their rent, because the potato crops had failed, and millions of others were starving and dying because the potato crops had failed, they didn't have any food, they didn't have anything to sell, they didn't have anything to eat. And Ireland was pretty much not a nice place to be in the 1870s and the British government were not being particularly helpful around the situation as well. Many were just forced from their homes and they couldn't pay rent. The army was sent over, um, known as listed men, evict, forcibly evict people. So many, many Irish people didn't have anywhere to go in Ireland and didn't have any hope in Ireland. So many emigrated, many went to Australia, many went to America, many went to England, to places like Birmingham and Newcastle within England. But most notably, many Irish people, in fact, most at this time, mostly in America and Australia, many Irish people went to Scotland, to Edinburgh, Glasgow and Dundee. Scotland was known as the workshop of the British Empire at the time, it was the heart of the Industrial Revolution, so many Irish people saw Scotland as a massive land of opportunity because there was heavy industry, there was jobs aplenty, and they felt that Scotland was more culturally similar to Ireland, so they wouldn't miss their homeland too much if they went to Scotland. So many once they'd been forcibly evicted or just decided that they couldn't stay in Ireland anymore, spent their life savings more often than not on a ship ticket to cross the Irish Sea to get to Scotland and many got jobs building railways, working down mines, digging canals, working in docks, building ships. Scotland was the place to go for many Irish people. Millions of Irish people emigrated to Scotland in the 1870s and it wasn't until Scotland's economic situation changed in the later 19th century and Scots started moving away from Scotland, that Scotland was the preferred destination for many Irish people. And it was actually more expensive to go to Scotland than it was to go to America or Australia from ports in Ireland as well, due to the popularity of Scotland as a destination. So many Irish people ended up in Scotland. But Scotland wasn't, turned out not to be the place that the Irish immigrants were expecting. And that's what we're going to move on now. We're going to talk about how the Irish settled in Edinburgh, where they settled, and some of the problems they faced. So as previously mentioned, millions of Irish people packed up their stuff, got on ships, and moved to Scotland. And most importantly, Edinburgh. So Edinburgh in the 1870s was boom town. There was loads of industry in and surrounding Edinburgh. And more importantly, because Edinburgh was a growing city, there was new railways being built and the Union Canal linking Edinburgh to Glasgow for the transport of goods was being built as well. So there was loads of work for the new Irish immigrants. And many Irish came to work as navvies as they were known. So navy means navigator, and built basically navvies were the guys that built railways and canals. So the new line out to Fife and extensions to the existing railway lines were getting built in the 1870s. So many Irish people came over and those were the jobs that they picked up, digging up canals and building railways. And Edinburgh really was a boom town. People saw Edinburgh the way I think later on many people viewed New York as it was a city of opportunity. But unfortunately, Edinburgh turned out not to be what the Irish immigrants were expecting. First of all, they congregated or sort of found themselves living in some of the worst slums in Europe around the Cowgate. So, so many people moved to the Cowgate in Edinburgh. It was an area uh, called that because of the butchery that used to happen there earlier on. That used to be Edinburgh's main sort of meat market, so it became known as the Cowgate. Many Irish people moved to the Cowgate, so many in fact that the Cowgate became known as Little Ireland and these were some of the worst slums in Europe. The conditions were horrible, diseases like cholera were rife, so many Irish people escaped bad conditions at home only to find 
just as, if not worse, conditions, just as bad, if not worse, conditions when they came to Edinburgh. They were forced into one bedroom flat. Sometimes three or four families would be sharing a, a single end, or literally one room. There wasn't even a bedroom, then three or four families would have to share that. Bearing the mind, families back then were very, very big. And the poverty was disgustingly horrible. The second issue facing many Irish immigrants in Edinburgh was the sectarianism and xenophobia that many Irish people faced when they moved. Now, there'd been a wave of Italian immigration to Edinburgh just before the big wave of Irish immigration, and they faced many of the same problems. A lot of the Italian immigrant population in Edinburgh congregated down in Leith, so did the Irish. And the problem was that at that this time, Scotland was a deeply religious Protestant nation, and many Irish people faced problems because of their religious beliefs, but more importantly, in the east of Scotland, it wasn't as prevalent sectarianism in the east of Scotland, was just general xenophobia that immigrants faced, they worried that they were being taken their jobs. There was many riots in Edinburgh surrounding Irish and Italian immigrants and Polish as well. There was many Polish immigrants came to Edinburgh at this time, and it wasn't a nice atmosphere. They received a pretty cold welcome in Edinburgh and weren't respected, people viewed them as drunkards, brutes, thieves, and the Scottish population in Edinburgh weren't exactly happy at the new visitors. So many Irish people struggled to make a life in Edinburgh and it wasn't at all what they'd expected to be. They weren't welcome there and they lived amongst filth and unsanitary conditions in Little Ireland or the Cowgate. So it wasn't exactly the city of opportunity they'd been promised when they spent their life savings to go on a ship to get to Edinburgh. But two men, two very important men, had an idea to bring the Scottish and Irish communities together and try and make Edinburgh a better place and a more positive place for the young men on both sides of the divide. And that's what we're going to move on to next. So there's two very, very important figures when we talk about the foundation of Hibs. And the first is this man right here, Canon Edward Hanahan, who was the priest at St. Patrick's Church. St. Patrick's Church was the main church for the Irish population living in the Cowgate, but also a few of the Italian immigrants went there as well. And Hanahan noticed that there was a very, very big social and religious divide between the Scottish population in Edinburgh and the Irish population in Edinburgh. And Hanahan didn't like that because he wanted the people to come together and for the reputation of Irish men being drunk and lazy and violent to go away. He wanted that um, stereotype to be banished. And he'd founded a youth organisation which had been doing a good job. But he thought, how do we really bring these lads together? Because there's still a lot of problems in Edinburgh with um, sectarianism and xenophobia. I want to stop this. So Hanahan t looked towards a new game at the time. You've got to bear in mind football was a new thing at this time. He looked at football and he realised that football was a positive way to bring the community together. He noticed it in England um, in his travels and he'd noticed it predominantly in Scotland. Now, there wasn't many football teams in Scotland at this time. Um, football was taking a wee bit slower to catch on up here. So Hanahan thought, you know, this football game, it looks quite good and it looks like it would bring young men together positively. So Hanahan thought, we need to found a football team and surely that'll bring the communities together, get them talking and get the lads doing something productive that'll keep them away from the alehouses, keep them away from the pubs. So that was why Hanahan wanted to found a football team. And as a prominent community leader, it was very, very, you know, he was very, very respected and it was very, very important to the story that he founded Hibs. And he basically was the brainchild. He was the father of Hibs. He, he was the guy that really wanted to have Hibs founded. Now, we'll go on to more of the naming of the club and that later. So, Hanahan was also the first president and manager of Hibs as well. So, he's a very, very, very important figure in the club's foundation. And Hanahan um, served as club president up until his death in the later 19th century, and he's now buried near St. Patrick's with a plaque from the Hibs Historical Trust to commemorate his importance in finding the club. So Hanahan's the most important figure. The next man is very important from the playing side of things, and we'll talk about him next. So our next figure, and this is the man very important from the playing side of things, is Michael Wheelahan. Now, Wheelahan was a 21-year-old Navy and a member of Hanahan's youth organisation, and Wheelahan said... You know, I like the idea of this, I'll help you. So he got the young lads together and he said, do you want to be part of this project? And he was a really driving force of getting it out in the community. And when we were eventually founded as a club, Wheelan was also our first captain and was a very prominent player at the time and was a very talented player. Now Wheelan 
sort of move things forward with helping us get recognition with the SFA as well, which at the time was a big, big problem. Again, that's something that I'll go on to later, but the SFA weren't comfortable with a team like this playing in uh, their football setup at all. So it, it was a big, big battle, and Wheelahan was involved in this, getting Hibs recognised and getting us playing at the top level in Scottish football. Without Wheelahan, we might have never had a club. Wheelahan was very, very prominent, like I said, in the playing side of things as well. Club's first captain, a very, very talented player by all accounts, and very, very passionate about helping the club go. And as a young man, he helped bring the young lads that Hanahan wanted to bring in. He, he was very prominent in doing this at 21 he had a lot of knowledge well beyond his years and he helped bring in the lads into the club. And he was also a very prominent um, member of the club at boardroom level as well. He helped hand him a lot of decisions as president and he really helped push things forward. He was from a similar part of Ireland to Hanahan as well, so they got on very well. He was basically Hanahan's right-hand man. So these two men are very, very important when we talk about the Foundation of Hibs because they helped Hibs get founded. So now that we've talked about our two most prominent figures in the foundation of the club, I'll move on to how the club came to be, how it was named and sort of the very early playing history. In this building here, St Patrick's Church, in 1875, a very important meeting was held. This meeting was with Hanahan, Wheelahan and the lads that had decided they wanted to be part of the project to form a football club. And the meeting was basically to decide how, what we're going to name this club that was the most important thing and what's its identity going to be. So there was a lot of deliberation about how the club was going to be named. There was a lot of options floated about. And there was many names that were proposed and rejected. And eventually, Hanahan remembered that the Latin name for Ireland was Hibernia. And this was a big significant thing because a big part of Hibs was also making the Irish lads in Edinburgh be proud of their roots and be proud of their heritage because due to the conditions at the time they weren't and he thought well why don't we call our football club Hibernian so Irish football club that was what Hibernian means in Latin Irish so he decided to name the team Hibernian football club Irish football club so it was a big big statement that yes we're going to be working with um, integration as well but we also want to show we're proud of who we are and we're proud of our roots because most of the young lads found in the club at the time were Irish so Hannah and Wheelan uh, got the name ratified the, everybody was happy with that and well they must have been because it's stuck it's stuck up until 2021 so they must have been happy with it so they founded it that was at Hibs Hibernian the High Bees that's how her name came about the next thing was the club identity and that's where more easier decisions were made once they got the name they realised well why don't we go for it they decided that the colours of the club would be green for Ireland and that the club crest and motto would be closely linked to Ireland as well the club crest picked out was the harp which is still on our badge today the harp of Ireland and the club's motto would be Erin Gobra which in Gaelic means Ireland forever they really wanted to push the Irish identity but wanted to include other people as well. So Hibs is basically a club founded to battle xenophobia against um, immigrants. So that was that. Erin Gobra was decided as the motto. The harp was decided as the logo. And of course, Hibernian was picked as the name. And like I said, if you're ever in Edinburgh, you can go and visit St Patrick's and there is the plaque in there that the Historical Trust put in that commemorates where we were founded and the meeting to make sure Hibs was to become the club we are today, basically. So these, this is a very, very significant event, this meeting, because basically it's when everybody agreed it would be called Hibernian, we'd play in green, and that the Irish harp would be our badge in Erin Gobra, Ireland forever, would be our motto. Now we're going to move on to the playing side of things and how that sort of came to be. So our new club has a badge, colours, a motto, and more importantly, a name, Hibernian. Now we need to get recognition from the football authorities and this was the biggest hurdle that Wheelahan and Hanahan faced when trying to get um, Hibs recognised by the football authorities because, as we discussed in the previous section about the historical background, Scotland wasn't the most tolerant place at the time and the idea of a club with Irish roots didn't exactly sit comfortably with the football authorities or Edinburgh City Council for that fact either. 
and there was a lot of problems. This was like a really, really big hurdle, and it looked like we weren't going to be allowed to play football, and it might even become an illegal, illegal organisation because it immediately we were lumped in with wanting home rule in Ireland. Now, this was there was elements of it in the club certainly, but mostly the club was a uh, outreach and youth program to help the young men of all backgrounds in Edinburgh keep away from drink and do something positive and integrate the communities positively but because of the political situation at the time it was immediately associated to home rule and that didn't fly too well with the authorities at all. Now there was a few clubs that advocated for a recognition and the most surprising, this is a brilliant part of the story, the most surprising was a certain club in Gorgie called Heart of Midlothian. Now People know that Hearts are our biggest rivals, so why would they want us founded? At the time, there was very few clubs in the east of Scotland, and football wasn't that popular in the east of Scotland. Hearts wanted another Edinburgh club to play regularly and to represent the capital, so Hearts went, you know what, let these guys get founded. So, weirdly, Hibs owe it to Hearts for their existence, which is a bit weird, um, and not a fact that many Hybees would like to admit, but Hearts did actively advocate for our foundation, and were one of the very first clubs to recognise us. Now, obviously, that grew into a very deep-seated rivalry, which is a good thing. It's one of the oldest football rivalries in the world, probably. So there was that, but Hearts were one of the very few clubs to advocate for us being founded. A one club that wasn't too up on us being founded was, of course, the Glasgow Rangers. A lot of the Glasgow clubs didn't like an idea of another Edinburgh club, regardless of what their background was. Um, so the SFA and the football authorities sort of were iffy about us. We didn't fully get recognised by the SFA until the 1880s, but in the 1870s, regional, the East of Scotland Football Association, did recognise Hibs, and we were allowed to play, and a very, very important event occurred on Christmas Day of 1875. It's the Meadows, it's a misty Christmas Day, and two football teams meet. Now, young lads were sent out to go and claim the best part of the field, and keep people away. A local constable was the referee. There wasn't it wasn't played on association rules, but two teams met. Hibs, the newly founded Hibernian FC, and Hart and Midlothian played in a misty field in the middle of, in the middle of the meadows on Christmas Day, eighteen seventy five. And that was our first recognised game of football. And that is also the first recognised Edinburgh derby, making it probably one of the oldest derbies in world football. So that was the first recognised Edinburgh derby, Christmas Day, eighteen seventy five. And that was our first game of football as a club. Unfortunately, the Jam Tarts ran out as the winners. Um, but we gave a good account of ourselves and that was that that was our first game, a moment that didn't seem like it was going to happen when there was issues with the football and authorities and society in general. We came out and it attracted a big and by all means noisy crowd. You'll see the graphic that I picked up. Um, the Frank Boyle, the cartoonist for the Edinburgh Evening News, did that. So um, fantastic from him. And you'll see the field where it occurred as well. And this is a massive, massive event in our club's history, getting to play football, a football game, it's our first ever football game, our first ever game of football, and um, we owe everything that's happened since, the Scottish Cup win in 2016, European adventures, the famous five, we owe all of that, Hibs owe all of that, to that one game in the Meadows against Tarts on Christmas Day, 1875, and also the first ever Edinburgh derby, all those Edinburgh derby moments down the years, wouldn't have happened without that one game. So that is a, this is a very vital part. Now, the picture that you seen at the start was actually the squad in 1876, but it would have been largely the same. And the man in the middle with the moustache right in the middle is our first ever club captain, Wheelahan, Michael Wheelahan. So we're now going to move on to talk about some of the more, some of the later on and some of the more historically significant facts about Hibs. So now we're going to move on to some other bits of history that are important to the Hibs story and how Hibs are founded. And just before I move on to that, it's a note that I'd like to bring up in this. And people are wondering, that looks awfully like a Celtic shirt, the shirt that you showed us and the shirt that the guys are wearing in the 1876 squad picture. This is because this uh, shirt here is widely recognised as the first ever Hibs shirt. And it is officially recognised by the club as the first ever Hibs shirt as well. So... 
Nobody really knows where the hoops came from, partly because a lot of teams at the time just used that design. A lot of teams in England and um, other teams in Scotland, like Queen's Park, used that design at the time. And also it's because white material was cheaper and easier to dye as well, which is probably why we picked it. Because I had the green in there for, um, obviously, our colours. Our, that was a colour that was picked by the um, founders of the club. And of course, I had HFC in the middle. So this is the widely recognised first Hibs kit. We changed to the colour that everybody knows today. Our colours as everybody knows today, green with white sleeves. Actually, in the 30s, in 1935... I think, don't quote me on that, Hibs changed to the colours we know today, but uh, before that it was dark green um, for most of the late 19th century after Celtic were founded, the most of the early 20th century up until the 30s, and then the colours that everybody widely recognises as Hibs colours today didn't actually come about till the mid-30s, but that was our shirt. Just thought it'd be an interesting point of reference to bring up that um, Celtic decided to take that on in the 1880s, and league rules around shirts are pretty similar to the to how they are now so we had to change to having dark green and then it changed to the colours that everybody knows as Hibs colours in the 30s so I just thought it'd be an interesting point to bring up about the shirt there but that shirt is widely recognised one picture there which you can see in Hibs Club Museum is a replica that was made in the 90s um, for a play about Hibs the Hibs story that was on during the Fringe Festival so it's not it's not from eighteen seventy five. I think it'd look a little worst for, worst for wear if it was. That I just thought it'd be an interesting point of reference to bring up for everybody there. So now we're going to move on to some later history that is still very very important to the Hibs story. Another important piece of Hibs history that is really important to our story as well, and it's not so much linked to how we founded, but I did want to add it in instead of making a separate video because it it you just find it just it's all part of the Hibs story. Is how we became linked with Leith and our home Easter Road, because we're founded in the Cowgate, which is, you know, not anywhere near Leith, really, so how did we end up there? It was actually out of necessity that we ended up at Easter Road and Leith. Now, we played in the Meadows, that was all fine and well, but as football became more developed and popular, it wasn't going to suit. Now, for a little while, we played at the Powder Hall dog track, um, which is now long, long, long gone. The Greyhound Racing was very, very popular back then, and there was a football pitch in the middle of it. Again, that became inadequate, so eventually, in 1893, we went down to Leith and ended up at Easter Road. Now, we did move about a little bit. We lost the lease on Easter Road, and then there was other problems, but Easter Road was our home from 1893 onwards, um, almost consistently apart from a few issues with leases and all that, but we've been at East Road ever since. So we actually moved to Leith because we could, just couldn't find a ground. We were quite um, nomadic, I'd say, moving around most of the east of the city, playing in various different places, the most notable being Powder Hall Dog Track, um, where we saw a lot of our early success and the Meadows where we played most of our early years. But East Road's been our home for the best part of just over 100 years consistently. Um the 1893s when our first ground was opened on the Easter Road site. The ground, as you see Easter Road today, was began development in the 90s with eventually it all being fully completed in 2010 when the old East Terrace was taken down and the new East Stand was built. So we moved in Easter Road in 1893. We only really became linked with Leith because we moved there out of necessity. Which is, people find that interesting. People think that we've always been linked with Leith. But whilst we did have a lot of support in Leith, we only really moved there because we had to. Um, it was a suitable site and that's where most of our support come from now. And Leith has become part of our identity. On our badge you see, see a ship. Now, there's two stories behind the ship. There's one that it's obviously to signify the Irish people coming and moving over in a ship, but the more widely accepted story is it's a ship to signify the port of Leith. And also our new motto, Erin Gobra, in the age of um, sectarianism in Scottish football, wouldn't exactly be acceptable. Um, and that became sort of recognised later on. Our new motto is Persevere, which happens to be the motto of Leith as well. Persevere. Um, and of course, this is something that became big during the 2016 Scottish Cup win. So Leith became a really, really big part of our identity as a football club. And that was all due in part to us moving there because we didn't have a proper ground so it was a happy accident that's turned out to be a very 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 big part of our club's history and our club's identity so there you go next we're going to move on to talking about early honours 
in our history as well, sort of the early um, silverware we picked up. So we've got those two little interesting bits of information about the kit and Easter Road out the way. We're going to move back to a very significant event, which was our first piece of major silverware. So this came in 1887, only 12 years after we were founded. And that, that was a good feat back then, given that it was mostly more well-established clubs that had, were winning trophies. And given that we weren't exactly very popular with the authorities, this was a big step to win it within 12 years. Now... Before this Scottish Cup success, we'd been very successful in regional football, especially in the east of Scotland, winning the east of Scotland Shield, which was a big deal back then, and beginning to challenge Hearts, who were, of course, the dominant force in east of Scotland football at that time. So that's probably what bred the rivalry as well, the fact that we challenged Hearts' dominance as well. So 1887 was actually a successful year because we... Won, we won a double of sorts, we won the East of Scotland Shield. So we got the Scottish Cup final against a very highly rated Dumbarton side who were very, very successful and were expected to win. The big Western team was expected to win the trophy, no problem. The big um, Glasgow side, if you like, not really Glasgow, but close enough, was expected to win the trophy and we ran out 2-1 winners. Now, what was really nice about this is both Hanahan and Wheelahan, who had founded the club um, 12 years previous, were around to see this. So Wheelahan was actually the president at the time, and interesting fact, it was Wheeler that inadvertently helped found Celtic as well, because sitting in a pub, he approached some guys in Glasgow and said, you should uh, found a club through here like ours, and then that's how Celtic were born, but that's a story for another day, it's a story I'm sure a Celtic fan could talk about, but Wheeler was there, he was the club president, and Hanahan was quite old by this point, so there's not really records to suggest he ever did make it, but he would have seen it in the papers. It was a big deal in Edinburgh, um, us winning the cup. It was all over the papers. We got a um, big fancy parade and everything as well. So it was a major, major big deal, and especially beating a Dumbarton side like that. Now, 1887 was a good year because we became the, un we became the unofficial champions of the world. Um, it was an arranged thing because football at that point hadn't really spread out across the rest of the world fully yet. Um, the, uh, the winner of the Scottish Cup and the winner of the FA Cup in England would play each other and the winner would be the unofficial champions of the world so we played Preston North End and beat them and that made us the unofficial champions of the world just a funny little bit of um, trivia to put in there for you so 1887 was a massive, massive year for silverware two cups, um, the East of Scotland Shield which was a big deal and of course the big in, our first major piece of silverware the Scottish Cup, a competition that would come back to haunt us as um, everybody will know, if you know Hibs, a competition that will come back to haunt us. So that was at 1887, a very, very prestigious year. As you can see, the team there was pictured as the Scottish Cup winning team. Wheelham was the president. I'm sure he's pretty happy to see how his project turned out by that point. It only took him 12 years. I, didn't, I don't think he'd have believed he would have lived to see them win a major piece of silverware but there you go so we were very very happy with um, what must have must have been very very happy with what happened so there you go that was us 1887 first Scottish Cup and now we're going to talk about the more interesting one which was 1902 so this is the furthest we'll flash forward in time but it's a very significant year which is 1902 the year we won our first league title and did the double won our second and what turned out to be our last Scottish Cup for quite a long time, if people know about the Scottish Cup curse, it's our last one until 2016, but this is a very significant year because it's when we grew from just being an Irish club, or a club for the Irish community and an integration project, It grew. we grew into being a club from Edinburgh and a club that Edinburgh could be proud in. Um, so we won that cup against Celtic 1-0 and we won the league title and a lot of people from Edinburgh began to take really really big notice of us of course it was the buzz in, 18, in 1887 when we won the um, Scottish Cup but really the 1902 team became uh, caused a big big stir in Edinburgh a lot of people were impressed with players like um, Bobby Atherton now Bobby Atherton was our first technically foreign player um, came coming from Wales and that's when we began to diversify out of being a club for the Irish and Scottish communities in Edinburgh to being a, just a football club in general and we, we really began to diversify in 1902 like I said, that first league title came, which is a major, major step. That's why I'm talking about this. It's, it's, it's a big, significant part of our history, our first of our four league titles. And then um, 
that's when we sort of grew into the club we are today in 1902, won that Scottish Cup, then the famous curse came along and that team back then also influenced a lot of English sides as well, they took a look at us and it, it wouldn't be the last time either, they took a look at us and went, you know what, I like we like how Hibs are playing, so this is the year we became more than a club from the slums of Edinburgh to help the um, communities out, the community out, it, it, this is when we became a proper force to be reckoned with in Scottish football because apart from that 1887 Scottish Cup, we had been still only a regional force apart from the 1887 Scottish Cup, so there you go, 1902, big important year because we grew as a football club and really, really grew out of that sort of view of being a small club from the slums of Edinburgh for the Irish community and really became a club that was for Edinburgh in general and could challenge Hearts and could challenge the clubs in the west of Scotland. So, very significant year 1902. We'll now move on to a significant figure from Hibs's past. Before we move on to my sort of summing up bit, there is one figure in Hibs's history that we just can't ignore, and that is, of course, James Connolly. Now, if people have done modern studies or you just know a lot about socialism or whatever, you will know that about James Connolly. He was the father of the Irish socialist movement and was a big um, advocate of a socialist independent Scotland and a united socialist Ireland and he was the father of the Scottish socialist movement as well now the reason I'm bringing that up is not because of anything political it's just good to have such a historical figure linked to Hibs and that's because James Connolly was present at the meeting when we were founded and he was a young lad at the time and was then also helped lay out kit and everything for the first game and um, we basically was a kit boy um, James Connolly helped lay kit out according to the, um, st as the story goes, there's not really any records to prove it back then, but he was present at the meeting, we know that for sure, that founded Hibs and he was a Hibs fan as well, he watched a few games until he's, um, he went over to Ireland and ended up getting executed in the Easter Rising, but James Connolly is perhaps one of the biggest significant historical figures linked to the club, he was born in the Cowgate, one of the sort of second generation immigrants that uh, helped out um, formed the club um, and he, like I said he was present at that meeting he helped lay kit out and he was a supporter as far as we know for all of his life until he was executed in 1916 so I thought I'd like to bring that up because the identity of our club and the way James Connolly was and everything it is very very big to have um, such a prominent historical figure be part of our club and support our club now we've got other significant historical figures such as the Proclaimers but I, I'd, I'd thought it'd be better to talk about something around the time period, so there you go, um, you got James Connolly, a big, big historical significant figure linked with Hibs, and like I said, even though he was a young lad, that um, contrary to popular belief, he didn't play for Hibs, a lot of that story does get floated about, but uh, he never did, he was too young, um, the membership age I think was 18 at the time, so he was too young to play for Hibs, but he did help lay kit out, and he was at the meeting to, that helped found the club, because the records do show that, that he was there as a lad, so thought I'd add that in, we're now going to move into my summing up. So obviously, now Hibs are one of Scotland's big five clubs, you described the big five in Scotland, Rangers, Celtic, Aberdeen, Hearts and us, and then I'm sure a lot of people will argue for a bigger one, I don't like saying Hearts are there as a hippie, but there you go, it's, it has to be admitted, so we're, the big, we're part of the big five of the historical clubs in Scottish football, and I don't think when these guys pictured here walked out on that pitch in Christmas Day 1875, I don't think they ever imagined what Hibs are going to end up being. We are one of Scotland, Scottish football's big names. We're a club that a lot of people around the world support. We've got supporters in Australia, America, Germany, Sweden, France, Spain, Italy, um, England. So there's a lot of there's Hibs supporters all over the globe, um, which I don't think when these guys first met in a church to found a club, found a club, I don't think they ever expected such a, you know, to, 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 for it to grow to be what it was, and like I said, 1902 is when we really began to grow, but when these lads found the club, because, you know, they founded it as a community project, Wheelahan and Hanahan, I don't think ever, ever expected Hibs to get to the, the stage where we're at, we grew from a club out of the uh, disease-ridden slums of the Cowgate. We grew from a small club in the disease-ridden slums of the Cowgate that was made to um, sort of bring the communities together and make well-rounded um, young men um, that were of morally upstanding character. I don't think they ever expected that to grow into a club that would play in European semi-finals, win cups, win leagues. Um, 
come out and sit in third in the league now and um, cause their fans no end of heartbreak, heartbreak. I don't know how many times Hibs have nearly caused me an aneurysm, but that you know, I don't think anybody back then could have ever foreseen the legacy that Hibs is left. And it's all down to these guys, right? If Hanahan and Wheeler hadn't had that discussion about forming a football club and um, to help uh, the young lads out of Edinburgh, I don't think we would have been around today, to be honest. And they faced a lot of adversity, they faced a lot of challenges, but they overcame it. And we have a football club thanks to them. We've got to thank the Irish community in Edinburgh, we've got to thank Wheelham, we've got to thank Hannah Him, we've got to thank the young Scottish men and young Irish men that got involved and played in that first ever game in 1875 on Christmas Day. We've got a lot in the main picture here are the ones we've got to thank the most for having a football club and um, I think that's, I can't really overstate how much of a legacy it's left behind. The fact that we've come from a club from the, like I said, disease-ridden slums to now being one of Scotland's biggest out of the, probably one of the biggest five clubs in Scotland that is really amazing to think of the level we are at now compared to what we were when we were founded. Our humble beginnings, I think, have been well and truly left behind, but they're not forgotten. If you want to find out more information, guys, please go into the Hibs Historical um, Trust website. I'll link all that in the description and go over that a bit more in the outro. So you go, we're a hugely significant club, not just for the history of Edinburgh, but the history of Scottish football as well, and the history of the Irish community in Scotland. So I will now jump on a special shout-out that I've got to do before we move on to the outro. So we'll jump on to that. Just before I move on to my outro, I'd like to give a shout-out to the European Women's Football Roundup. Ran on Twitter by the good people over at the Hibernian Women's Supporters Club. Uh, you get all your football news from the major um, women's leagues in Europe and all the major competitions. So if you're interested in women's football, I'd highly recommend you go over and fo- get drop them a follow on Twitter. Link will be in the description. It, it's a great page. You get all your European women's football information. So please follow them, guys, um, if you're into the women's game and you're interested in the women's game because um, they're looking for followers. They need followers and... It would really be appreciated if you did. Loads of great information, player profiles, up-to-date results, league tables, the whole shebang. So go over there and follow them. I'll link it in the description. Going to cut to the outro now. So as always, guys, thank you for watching the video. The support means a lot. I, I just I love doing these sorts of videos. So thank you so, so much, guys. I thought it was about high time I did some Hibs content. And because I was getting a few of my English and German subscribers asking, oh, what's the history of Hibs? I thought, you know what? Why don't I just do the history of Hibs um, and how we were founded to start us off? Because you guys like these um, football and history videos, the Stalais and Hüttenstadt and the uh, one about the Fürwerts, the club of the East German Army were really popular, so were the Leipzig Derby guys and everything like that. So you like the content, I'll do the content. And I thought, you know what, it's about time I did some Hibs stuff, like I was saying. So I thought, why not do it about how we were founded? Because it is an interesting story and a story that's important not just to the history of Edinburgh, but the history of Scottish football and the history of um, how diverse Scotland is as well. So it is a really interesting story. And there were some bits that before I did research, even I didn't know, and I know most of what there is to know about Hibs. So it, it was an, an eye-opener for me. I didn't know some of the stories. I didn't know about Hearts, so one of the first clubs to push our recognition. I didn't know that, for example. So... Yeah, a really, really interesting video for me to make and one that I enjoy because everybody knows uh, I love the Hibs. I love the high beast. So, um, yeah, I just thought it was about time I did some Hibs content and hope that it helps my English and German subscribers out get to know the um, story of Hibs. And for the, the high bees out there that might like me not knowing the full story, here you go. So I hope it's um, been an interesting one for you to watch. I really, really enjoyed making this one. It was I was sort of in my element here talking about Hibs. Um, so yeah that's that guys as always these videos do take quite a while to make they do take a while to get everything together so please show the appreciation if you can um, a like a wee comment to say oh that bit was good and I'm always looking for advice as well so don't be afraid to say if you didn't like a graphic or whatever drop it in the comments down below I do like to hear from you guys and um, that is that now before we go I'd like to say some special thank yous first of all the Hibs Historical Trust were out their website I wouldn't have um, known half of this stuff. You know, all the guys that contribute to that, I'm sure a lot of you'll know them, like Ted Brack and all that. They they do a lot of 
fantastic work because they, they go through records and everything to get all this information to a place where all the fans can access it. So I'll link them in the description, like I said, and I'll link some of the um, pages there that I used for my research so you can get a bit more background information. If you do want more background information on how Hibs are founded, there's loads of books that you can um, read, um, that you can buy on Amazon, so I'd definitely recommend that. Um, and... That is that, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you've learnt a little something about Hibs, a club that I'm passionate about. And this is the beginning of a bit more Hibs content on the channel. So you guys know the drill. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Smash that subscribe button for unique football content if you are new. And I will see you all in a while. Jack out.